The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. I'm Patrick, Head of Technology at professional services firm Collins SBA. I'm a former financial advisor who just loves solving business problems and creating better client experiences using technology. Join me each week as we unpack the tech on offer to advise professionals, stay on top of tech trends and help you break free from the analysis paralysis experience when building and maintaining a great tech stack. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where wealth technology is simplified. With Australia's number one platform for overall satisfaction and value, you don't need to imagine. NetWealth is continually investing in new tools and platform features to optimize your staff productivity and to give you and your clients the best user experience. With our managed accounts functionality, bring new efficiency and scale to your investment operations. A world of technology awaits. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Rated by Investment Trends number one for overall satisfaction by users from 2014 to 2022. To give listeners of the Advice Tech Podcast another avenue to solve technology problems that matter most and efficiently evaluate the landscape of advice tech providers, Ensemble has launched an advice tech space on its platform. If you want to know how your advice peers are solving their tech challenges, big and small, it's the place to go. Head to the Ensemble platform or use the link in the show notes to join today. Today we're talking meeting note automation as well as automation and AI in general with Cole Ginoli, Director at InSource Automation and Founder at Scribd. So I love the story on how Scribd came to be with Cole building many iterations of it in many businesses before turning it into a scalable, cost-effective, industry-agnostic software as a service or SaaS product. In addition to Scribd, Cole's automation consulting business, InSource Automation, helps create capable tech champions within small businesses, in particular using the Microsoft Power Platform, so Power Automate and Power Apps, etc. So InSource will build you uh, automation and apps for you, but with the focus on empowering team members to actually do these things themselves and learn those no and low code tools. I don't know if I've said this on the podcast before, but our business is actually built on and runs on tools like this. So in our case, it's Wakato and Salesforce Flow, and they genuinely give you superpowers and create environments where almost anything becomes possible. In our chat, we discuss the current state of AI and how it's now at a stage where it can be used in an automated and reliable way with consistent results or outputs, so no more hallucinations. And Cole gives us some great practical examples of automation as well as AI use cases, both for now and future. I started by asking Cole what the oldest piece of tech he still owns is, and whether he still uses it. Yeah, so I'm a MacBook user and have been for about, I reckon, 15 years now. But I still have an old tower or desktop PC sitting in my uh, in my office, uh, and it it is pretty much a glorified hard drive. It, it still has a bunch of photos on it from you know 10, 15 years ago that I haven't managed to take off. So it just lives in that capacity. I'm not even sure you could actually run any of today's modern applications on it, but it serves a purpose. Yeah, awesome. Now I'm. Um... I'm the same in terms of sort of Mac user, but it seems to be 95% of the time it's just plugged into like a docking station. So I use it as like a desktop anyway. Um, awesome. And it, yeah, definitely. So I guess, yeah, you've, you've taken us back sort of 10, 15 years. I know that um, Scribd as a product is, is you know, heavily influenced by AI or has AI in there, but is there maybe one or two ways that you're using AI separate from that either personally or in your business life or work life? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, obviously, probably using AI in a similar way that most of the listeners and, and other people uh, would be today, which is generative AI, so large language models like ChatGPT. But uh, somewhere I've found myself using it a lot more recently is is like the augmentation of apps or, or programs I use. So, okay. I use Lucidchart a lot for uh, workflow diagramming, things like that. 
that has now got its own inbuilt AI system. Same with something like ClickUp, which is what I use for task management. Yeah. Uh, I feel like those apps are starting to have their own uh, inbuilt AI and it's starting to get better and, and actually have a real use case. No, really cool. And yeah, it's, it's not really talked about that much, is it? It's like basically every app or every sort of SaaS um, software now really has that sort of inbuilt AI as a feature now. Like early days, it felt like it was just there because it had to be. But now what you're sort of alluding to is they're actually beneficial and, and doing something. Like with that Lucid chart example, have you got any examples of that? Because that's the first time I've heard of Lucid having AI in it, which is actually really exciting. Yeah, definitely. So I'll do like a consulting session and we'll map a workflow and a process and you can take those notes and that information and pass it to Lucid and it will produce a diagram for you and it will map, you know, the yes, no switches, uh, the terminators, et cetera, and put that in a, a basic diagram for you and then you can go and edit and fiddle as you would with any sort of workflow process. But it, it um, yeah, it just helps get the process started, I suppose. That's that's really cool. I've been, yeah, I'm sure many listeners have been waiting for that for a long time, especially for things like client um, structure diagrams. I posted in the the ensemble advice tech space about a separate app. It wasn't Lucid. It was called Eraser.io, which is like for developers. But to hear that Lucid has finally come to the the party there, that's that's next level. So I have to let the team know about that. And, yeah, ClickUp as well. Yeah, like they seem to be pretty – you know, pretty modern when it comes to, you know, workflow and trying to do everything. Is there anything there that you're seeing that's helping from a ClickUp perspective with AI? Yeah. So, so my process when dealing with clients is usually to create two things on ClickUp. So, it's a list for that client, uh, which is similar to say a Trello board or a list. Uh, and then the other one is a notepad. And that notepad is where I'll collect most of the information for the client. And then they have their own generative AI where you can query those notes. Uh, Let's say you take a bunch of information, you can ask it to produce a table for you. You can ask it to push this to your checklists, things like that, that uh, I think just save, you know, a few minutes, a little bit of time here and there, and and also pick up on things that you might miss. You know, they might add a task to a checklist that you might, you know, a late night or after a long day, you might just not throw it in there. Yeah. Um, So that's sort of, that's the primary use case in, in ClickUp. Very cool. And I guess as well, like micro efficiencies, like it's actually skipping that sort of classic chat GPT or copilot experience of, you know, I've got to copy this to somewhere else to <laughs> get into the list, but that feels like really embedded and really, um, really helpful to be honest. So that's awesome. And I guess moving on to, I guess yourself, um, like a professional origin story, it'd be really fantastic to know, Cole, I guess where you sort of started professionally and how you've got to where you are today. And then we'll jump into Scribed. <laughs> So uh, I started my professional career after uh, finishing my undergraduate in New- uh, Western Australia, so in Perth, uh, in a completely different industry. Started out in, in uh, of all things, electrical wholesaling as a graduate at a, a big uh, multinational. Uh, and after a few years, it just was not something that I was enjoying as much. So I uh, started on a master's of finance, uh, banking finance at Monash, which brought me to Melbourne and then got involved with a a financial planning and accounting group over here, which I was fortunate enough to work for and and progress through to their operations manager. And and in that role uh, and that time is where I I found a a real um, enjoyment or passion for automation. So how do we automate processes? How do we implement technology to make things smoother, simpler, simpler? And then over time, that led into me founding uh, in-source automation, which is my own automation consultancy and uh, firm, where I I work with primarily small businesses to to help uh, implement tech or automation solutions or help someone in their business. So help a champion who's really eager to to push these tools but doesn't necessarily know what they are or where to find them and things like that. So we'll run a a consulting-based session teach them how to use certain apps, certain products. And so that's that's sort of the journey, I suppose. And then part of that was uh, a product that I was producing on a client-by-client client basis for InSource was essentially scribed. Yeah, I would come in, I'd build them a custom application on their Teams or Microsoft environment mm-hmm. that, that did the same thing that Scribe did. Uh, and over time, I just started to realize that the cost to produce and the time to produce wasn't great. It's not great for an end user to have to wait two, three months for these kind of tools. Uh, and that was probably 
I think the first implementation of that individual solution would have been maybe 16 months ago now. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then a little bit into that journey, I decided, hold on, I think I should be trying to produce something that I can essentially assess that someone can log in and, and just plug and play. And that led to Scribed and, and that's uh, it's been a whole nother journey. That No, that's brilliant. Thank you for sharing that, Cole. I think, yeah, it's so cool to have been able to build something after, I don't know, doing it over and over again. And I assume you would have built, you know, the second or third one for the third client a bit differently to the first one. This is probably more advanced and you got to go back to number one. Like, yeah, it's just it's it- awesome that you've been able to do that. And I'm, yeah, really excited for today's discussion, not just limited to Scribe, but also, as you mentioned, with the um, the automation consulting there in terms of learning more about that and really, as you mentioned, like empowering or, you know, being able to uh, empower uh, people in their businesses as the, I guess, on your website, in source, the actual definition suggests is being able to <laughs> make use of what you have and um, make those people in your team grow. So that is so exciting. Do you mind if we, uh, yeah, give us an overview of Scribed and uh, obviously you mentioned that you've you've installed it or built it in many businesses before, turned into a SaaS. What does it do and, and what problem does it solve? Yeah, so, so Scribed is a service agnostic document generation tool, I suppose is this the broad definition, but what does that mean? It essentially is a product that can ingest an audio file or a transcript, so text or audio, and turn that into a specific style of document, so an industry-specific document. Uh, the, the most common use case, and, and partially because of my background in financial planning, is a, a, a you know, a file note for a financial planner. So an advice presentation note, an annual review file note, et cetera. So it's it's essentially designed to be a really lightweight tool. We're not trying to add a ton of features and, and beef it out. We're trying to build a tool that allows users to come in quickly, upload an audio file, a text, uh, a say meeting minutes or a transcript, get a summary, and then go back to their preferred system. You know, in today's sort of modern tech world, we have tools like HubSpot, Salesforce, industry-specific CRMs. We're just trying to make it really easy for users to produce these file nodes for compliance and then take them away and do what they do with them. Awesome. I love it. Um, It's, yeah, I I set up uh, an account. It was really easy to do so. So thank you for enabling that. I mean, anyone could do that, but you helped me out massively. And yeah, just going in really lightweight, as you said, and it feels that way that it's just so easy and intuitive to get what you need to, you know, get it done. So from the point of view of, you know, going into that tool, um, you know, passing through an audio file, do you mind sort of talking about a bit more about the sort of template side of things and what that sort of means for the, the outputs that you get at the end of it? Mm -hmm, Definitely. So there's uh, uh, sort of three groups of templates, you could call them. Uh, So the first group is is, uh, user-wide. So everyone off the bat gets a handful of templates, things like a summary email to a client, uh, a process guide, which is something that we see used a lot, uh, a CRM note, and a a handful, I think there's five or six just general templates. The next level to that is then industry-specific so financial planners will have an annual review file note template or an advice presentation template, and they're tailored to touch on specific points that you know financial planners discuss regularly, such as risk profiles, uh, consent, fees, etc. Then there's a third level on top of that that we would call organizational templates. So if a user uh, or a group has a set of templates they already use, they can send them through to us and we'll set them up in a way where the AI will produce the, uh, an output based on their template. So if they have a specific file note template or something that they do, uh, a good example, I would say is something like an internal team meeting. We have a, a client or a group that has a Monday morning team meeting every week. And so they can record that meeting. They have a specific template and it'll pass out you know, action items for each person uh, within the team. It'll have the summary of the meeting and a few other touch points. Love it. No, it makes so much sense. And I think the, you know, I'm trying to think of like, you know, existing apps out there from the point of view of, you know, 85, 90% of the, I'm referencing the sort of net wealth, um, you know, advice tech buyers guide, but about 90% of financial planning practices are using, you know, the Microsoft suite. So there's obviously Copilot in there, or there's the, you know, if you're using Teams Premium, I think it's the sort of inbuilt um, AI summary, et cetera. But, you know, even, even when you've got like, you know, the same recurring meeting that's been in there for months or 
uh, it's happening every week, every day, etc. You actually can't get that structured output as you're sort of alluding to. So I think that's quite a differentiating factor, and it creates great um, consistency for businesses. I mean, you've mentioned a few there in terms of templates around, you know, the summary email um, process guide. I thought that was a really interesting one. I'd love to talk more about that, you know, fact finding, annual review, et cetera. Are there any sort of other interesting ways that maybe users are using it for that aren't sort of traditional for like AI note taking apps, do you think? Yeah, definitely. So I think there's a, a real group of people and, and these tools are really driving this change. But uh, something like the Voice Memos app on an iPhone these days is such a strong tool mm. and there's a real group of people who use it for almost anything. You know, if they're in the car for an hour a day, two hours a day, they're taking Voice Memos for anything. So we've got a set of users where we've put in templates for things like uh, LinkedIn posts okay. for video sketches and templates. Um Again, something we touched on before was your process guides. So a lot of uh, people will hold a meeting, an internal team meeting, where they run through a new process. They'll then pass it to the scribe, which will produce an SOP, a standard operating procedure or process guide that they can save on file. Um, I think probably the most interesting one or request we've had is is the LinkedIn post. That was definitely a good one. Um, it records a, the, the gentleman records a lot of uh, voice memos in the car and he's pretty active on LinkedIn. So that was a good one. That's no, that's so cool. Taking a marketing lens to it, and I, yeah, uh, traditionally where, yeah, you know, there's plenty of AI note taking apps out there, but they're all sort of focused on the compliance aspect of, you know, file notes in terms of the time it takes, but also the content. I think that they're fantastic examples, and that yeah, that process guide. Like, I will often do if I'm sort of building or releasing something for our team from a process point of view or functionality a quick sort of three to five minute loom video on the process, being able to throw that transcript in to something like Scribe to have that um, SOP come out of that is a fantastic example as well, not having to sort of, you know, repeat yourself or go through that process again. Would you say that's a great, well, not a great example, but um, obviously mentioned like extrapolating on that sort of process guide um, point, of th- point of view? Definitely. So I think, yeah. It's it's interesting the the rise in generative AI. So tools like Otter have been around for a long time. Yeah. These are tools that are, take your your recordings and turn them into transcripts. The the real change and the reason we've seen a rise in tools like this is using generative AI and, and large language models. We can actually get a, a, a pointed output. It's not just a summary and an action mm. items of a meeting. You can actually request specific documents, specific outputs. And that's, I think, driven this this big change in AI. It's that large language model ability to query. Yeah, I'm with you. And I guess just you sort of touched on it there, but, you know, I think obviously you're an in- industry agnostic tool and I was I sort of mentioned to you before we hit record, um, you know, I think we've showcased on this show at least sort of four um, AI note-taking apps at least this year. And I, I think there's at least sort of three others on my radar that are sort of yet to feature on the podcast I just yeah, I have a couple of questions for you. Like, why why do you think there's so many popping up? There's in particular around you know financial planning file notes, and then is there anything you want to add about why you would build one from scratch? I know you've sort of touched on that origin story around um, you actually building it you know one by one every time, but um, yeah, why there's so many popping up and why build one from scratch? Yeah, so I think. It builds on that that generative AI, yeah. the, the ability to pass the recording and get a specific output, a query. And the reason we've seen a big rise in, of that in financial planning is because there is a need. You know, there's a real pain point that is compliant file notes. And so it's it's like a match made in heaven. You know, it's the, the ability to record the meeting, get the compliant file note and turn what used to be 45 minutes into four minutes, a uh, quick review and then passing it on. Um, the the rise in products, there's, for me, as I've watched a few come out over the last 6, 12, 18 months, I feel like each one has has looked at a different problem. The first one that I remember coming across was just a transcript tool. They didn't have any audio recording capability, so it was just transcript in, file note out. The next one was a combination of audio and transcript. Then it was you can bring your own template. I think each one has has tried to attack a different problem, and the reason I wanted to build Scribe and push push it more is the problem that I don't think anyone's attacked yet is the cost. Yeah. So almost every other product or many of these products uh, are priced at one hundred and thirty dollars a month per user uh, at a minimum, 
Whereas Scribe, as I mentioned before, is that real lightweight tool. We're not we're not trying to add a lot of functionality. We're just trying to solve one problem and price at a at a really low or what I would consider sort of a in Reasonable. line with what we're paying for other product tools. Exactly. Yeah. So that's that's the pain point we've tried to attack. I don't by any means think that Scribe is reinventing the wheel mm-hmm. in regards to transcription and and AI and generative AI in terms of documents. But what we are trying to do is how do we make it more accessible to financial planners, accountants, and, and other people in the industry? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and, and sorry for that one. I think being number five in terms of on the list for this year to interview, I think it was only fair to ask you. But I yeah, really appreciate the transparency. And um, as yeah, listeners, you're able to see when you go onto the website, you know, the price is there. It's transparent, and yeah, the for you know compared to other tools. It's in often cases, you know, half the cost in terms of that monthly cost per user, which is awesome. And yeah, I guess I, I, oh, if, I can, if I can dive in, I think the the cost element is such a big one because I think we will see a driver of more applications and more tools that will benefit financial planning, but other industries. And by reducing the cost to get people using these products, we'll see more products produced. We'll see the ability for people to, you know, yeah. get feedback, get user input and create more of these products, which I think is, is really important. Oh, definitely. No, it's an exciting time and, um, yeah, the more the merrier. Get that competition going. So I guess if we're yeah, talking about cost and sort of barriers to entry, I'd love to sort of um, sort of switch the conversation more to the work that you're doing from an in-source automation perspective, so automation consulting. Obviously, you, you let us know or you explained how it came to be, but do you mind sort of taking us through, like I mentioned small business is the focus. Maybe if we sort of define what a small business is and then how do you generally sort of attack an engagement with a small business. I assume it's about you know finding out pain points, etc. But what's that sort of process you go through as you approach a small business? Yeah, so the the way we typically look at at what I would think of a small business that InSource would work really well with is is a business that has X number of team members but does not have a champion of IT. So mm-hmm. someone who is really driving you know your change in processes, your new tech, your new um, AI tools, etc. So that that small business can be one person, it can be fifteen people. It's just about, I think the the real defining point is whether there's someone in there already doing these things. In terms of how it sort of has grown, is we're trying to allow our clients or to use the tools that are available to automate their business. So. There is a plethora of tools these days, uh, and there's some really, really good ones. So a lot of people, I'd say, would be quite familiar with Zapier, which is like an automation tool. It's a self-service automation connection tool. Uh, What a lot of our clients and people uh, that we work with don't know is there's actually the equivalent of that in the Microsoft stack. It's called Power Automate. It's part of the Power Platform. And so a lot of our consulting and how we approach clients is, is primarily, are you working inside this stack? Are you in the Microsoft stack? In our industry, that's typically yes, In the, especially financial planning, a lot of Excel, counting, et cetera. Uh, and then what are, you, what are your different systems? Are you guys using different tools and systems and are they connected? And that's where something like a Power Automate or a Zapier and, and in-source automation can step in and go, how can we connect or integrate your system so they talk together, they talk better, uh, talk to each other better, sorry. Yeah. No, really, really cool. And yeah, it does amaze me how many businesses aren't familiar with, um, you know, one or the other, or sometimes both in terms of Zapier and, you know, Power Platform or Power, Power Automate, um, you know, creating flows, et cetera. And I, I would, I'm just assuming here, but in terms of when you go into a business and you're helping them with automation, like these are what we'd call sort of low to no code tools. You can, Use them as you know, no code if you want to, but you can ramp it up to you know a combination of low and no code, which is really really flexible for sort of developers and non developers or people that aren't you know the sort of standing in as the as the tech champion as we sort of mentioned there. There might be you know power planner, associate advisor um, jumping in, going you know, hey, look at this. So my question would be, are you are you jumping into those businesses, sort of helping build those flows or those recipes, etc., and then saying here's how you use it. Um, you can you know rely on me if you want to in terms of enhancing that or keeping that up to date or empowering them to use those tools in a better way as well so they can update those you know no to low code recipes um, as they need to yeah 
So off the bat, we'll look at some of just the, the really low hanging fruit yep. businesses. You know, there's always some really easy ones. Uh, it, tools like Calendly, they seem an age old now, but yep. some firms aren't using them. Some firms aren't using them to their maximum. So we'll step in and we can do uh, sort of the combination. We can set up your entire process on a tool like Calendly. Or you mentioned a tool before called Loom, which which we we'll use really heavily. We can create a, a you know a video on how to do these and how to implement them and pass that to someone. So I think the the initial consult is typically based on you know the low hanging fruit things that we can do quickly to make uh, to sort of gain a lot of efficiency, and then from there it, it depends what level of complexity the client wants to go to. So are they really trying to connect, you know, five different systems and push the automated workflow? In that sense, as you mentioned, some you might want to ramp up a tool with some code. If they're just looking for some simpler automations, you can provide guides on how to do that. I think. Like a great example would be something like data collection. Mm. A user, you might go to a firm who has a fact find that they're collecting via an email. Uh, you won't see it too often these days, but it might be something like that or an Excel document. You can convert that over to a, a tool in the Microsoft stack, such as Microsoft Forms. Link that with Power Automate. That can push straight to your CRM if you're not using you know, an enterprise-grade CRM that might already do these things for you. And then there's, you know, that that's part is, is part A. It's relatively simple stuff, but then you can go a step further and go, okay, do we want something like an approval flow? Does this information get passed straight to an insurer? So for something like a pre-assessment, is it a health or a risk questionnaire? Do you get an email and pass that on? And that's where we start to step in and say, okay, if you want to run these approval flows and and sort of higher level uh, tasks, then we will typically steer that for you and then write the code or the, the flows. Yeah, awesome. No, that's a couple of great examples. And I think with these tools, it really is your gateway to integration. Like it, they really are sort of, you know, the connectors. And other good examples would be just creating clients and external systems. Like you're just reducing that double entry. And I think when you mentioned the, you know, the fact find example, it it sound it can sound really scary, but when you jump into those sort of low to no code tools, just being able to see, I guess, you know, call them sort of data pills or data points where you can just grab the, the information and map them to wherever they need to go, you know, test it, et cetera. Like it's a really empowering experience and it really does give you superpowers, um, especially if you even if you haven't used anything like that before, like they're really um, or they can be straightforward. I think now they're, they're starting, starting to become probably quite overcomplicated because of the functionality that gets packed in, especially probably Zapier. Like that started out as so simple being, you know, just if this happens and this, but now they do sort of six or seven different things. Yes. Yeah. But I think- I think, um, I was going to say, I think that at InSource, something that we really try to do is is empower the user or the client to actually do these things themselves. Yeah. It's typically cheaper for them if they're in a, a simpler state and they have someone in their business who's eager to learn these tools. There is so much information on YouTube, on Microsoft Learn, on all of these platforms that we'll walk you through. Often where we'll step in is where they just don't have the time. They don't have someone to do the do the task or they don't have the time to do it themselves. And that's where they'll bring us in as a contractor and say, please do a week of work, knock yep. these out versus please teach our staff member how to do that. Awesome. And then do you do much of or do you see sort of much sort of graduating from that, um, you know, Power Automate flows into things like Power Apps? Do you see like sort of front facing or maybe explain, sorry, what the, you know, a Power App is and any examples or case studies you've got there? Yeah. So Power Apps is probably one level above Power Automate. It can be a little bit more difficult, but essentially what Power Apps is, is it enables people on the Microsoft stack to build applications that can be um, used on your iPhone, your Android phone, or your computer. Uh, and they typically run on a back end of Power Automate, the other tool we mentioned. And so definitely we we build Power Apps for a lot of clients uh, and we do see a handful of, of firms already using them. It's just difficult. They take a little bit more time to build, I think. Yep. So it's sometimes difficult for a smaller firm to justify that long-term investment. Um, yep. But a part of one iteration of Scribe was a Power App. Uh, and and where we still actually produce sort of a, a local version of Scribe for people, is, if, if you would like to call it that, is where they want to do more than just the file note. So we, we have a client who has what they call a servicing and structure document. And so after Scribe's 
process runs, they get taken to another screen on the Power App and they can work through a form. And, you know, there's yes, no's, AI will draw some of it, they'll tick different parts, and then they press done and then that'll push into your SharePoint and save on your client file and things like that. Um, so it's it's definitely growing. Power Apps is, is an amazing tool. Mm. And I think the more people who know about it and the more people who get using it, it'll just continue to grow. Yeah. No, I'm totally with you. And I think that's a great example of like, yes, they take, they can take, you know, a lot more time and the barrier to entry in terms of learning how to use it is is higher. But I think that feels like the ticket, at least in the current environment of, you know, using X plan, et cetera, to like really embedded workflows of this part is I need a, a human doing this step, but then the next three steps are automated and then you're back to the the human or the team member sort of, you know, with the, you know, manual decision making or the forms, et cetera. Like it feels really integrated. Yeah. So uh, specifically in financial planning, we have almost built for one client, you could call it a bolt-on to a CRM and it just connects directly to their CRM via an API. So they get a full list of their clients and they can just take actions that their CRM might not be as as efficient at. Yeah. So there's, you know, you open a client profile, you click a button and it says, you know, create ROA job. It's got all your default settings. It's assigned to the certain person and it's a one button. There's another button that says, you know, send Calendly invite. You click that button, it shoots an email off with the link in the email to the client, logs it as a note on their CRM. And that's how you can augment your yeah. CRM or your other tools really well with a Power App. Yeah, no, I think augment is definitely the right word. And it, yeah, it feels like that that is a ticket for businesses that are looking for that silver bullet. Like there is none, you just actually got to build it. And that's probably a great platform to do it on. And, you know, I always see, there's always like the classic sort of Microsoft videos where, you know, they're marketing, say, Paris, for example, and it's always like a manufacturing business or someone that's working in a factory with an iPad using Power Apps. Like it's trying to get away from like the, you know, inventory management and, you know, shift management, et cetera, to actual, you know, real life financial planning or wealth management examples. So it's really exciting. Is it? Is it? Yeah, definitely. I think Microsoft's, uh, famous business for uh, tutorials is Contoso, I That's think is right, what they call yeah. it, and that always inventory management. You're spot on. It's always in a workshop, yeah. but there is, there's so many more applications. Yeah, selling widgets. Yeah, I think oh, – <laughs> yeah, um, really get me up and going with this, Cole. I think from the point of view of like, um, you know, flows and automation, et cetera, where it gets even more exciting is, you know, we're talking about AI – um, you know, it's a front-facing tool where you're using things like ChatGPT, Copilot, etc. But you know, there's there's layers or levels to this. Like once you learn about you know Zapier, Power Automate, and then the fact that you can actually embed AI into those steps to automate things as well. Like that's when it just goes crazy. So, do you mind sort of talking about I guess some of your observations on where AI is now, and I guess yeah, what you're seeing? So I think uh, the last few iterations of AI and often people will equate this to open AI's GPTs because it's the yeah. largest and most popular. Uh, I think for a while there, we just saw them getting more information a little bit faster. They were trained on newer and more information. They could give different answers. I think uh, recently we've had two models come out that I find really interesting. The first is the O1 model, which has their what they're, they're coining the chain of thought or the ability to think. And so it'll take longer to give an answer, but it'll it'll think about it. And in essence, the, the, you know, they don't tell you this, and this is just the sort of what people think. But it's just reprompting itself. It's just right. taking your information, passing it, and then reprompting and going, "Please refine. Please make this more X, more Y." Um, so that's really interesting. I think that'll have a lot of impact on uh, like a big data sense if you're trying to query your entire client base or you know hundreds of file notes inscribed and things like that. That's where that'll uh, be really interesting. And then the other part, and I'm not going to try to say the name here because it's, <laughs> it's yeah. GBT40 dash something dash something dash something. They've actually just merged this into the standard GPT-4. It's not going to have a lot of effect on a day-to-day use. So logging into chat GPT, uh, you know, saying, please draft this email. That has no impact, uh, this new model. But what it does do is it allows tools to get what they're calling a structured output and 100% guarantee. And so I think that's going to be, I should explain that a touch more, sorry. Essentially, Mm -hmm. you can ask it to do something and it'll return a response in a 100% accurate output. 
And so where that I think will be really interesting in a financial planning space is think about a tool like X-Plan that you could combine with something like Scribed and ask for a specific output and it could give you, you know, you might have 40 data points. You can get them in the exact order and map them to something like an SOA or an ROA. And I think that's that's something that'll be massive. Again, I don't think I'm a day-to-day user. We will see that. But over the next six to 12 months, I think you'll see a lot of applications get really, really good at using AI in a really accurate way. Yeah. No, some great insight there. I think the... Yeah, like the the thinking process or, you know, taking time to respond in a more considered way and you were sort of explaining that it's really, you know, in some cases probably, I don't know, as you mentioned, re-prompting your sort of shitty prompt to go into the model so you get the answer you actually wanted. So it's getting more sort of context there and it makes a lot of sense from the point of view of if you're querying sort of big data for it to chunk it up, that makes a lot of sense. And, the, yeah, the structured outputs – it really says goodbye to the hope strategy of, you know, fingers crossed, this AI step is going to come back with what I wanted. Like I believe it would be a big step towards reducing hallucination. Would that be a fair assumption? Definitely, definitely. Um, I think I, I have this sort of utopian uh, view where a tool like Product Rex will be able to use it in combination with a file note to say specifically – ingest this ROA document or this piece of information and spit out a, a, a scale or a piece of text based on this information. So you might still actually have to pass it, you know, six different pieces of text as options, but it will then take that info and decide which is the best one. And, and I think you're dead right. That, that's where you'll see that hallucination reduce. Yeah. And it, it feels like this is also the ticket to really embedding that or augmenting that, as you mentioned before, into business process because you have that confidence, as you mentioned, 100% certainty that I think it's you know a strict, uh, a strict sort of checkbox is ticked in the background to say, this is the output we want. And that's, that is critical for yeah, integrating with other systems as well. And I believe, I'm just trying to think of some other examples, but it could be like, instead of, if you have a if you have an integration that you've set up, it might even be through like a Power App, for example, obviously not your Contoso widgets one, but more a financial planning accounting one. But it might be, you know, a natural prompt that says, create this person with this email address uh, in this system. And it picks up, you know, what the back end looks like for that system, passes it through because it knows what the, I guess, the data model is and comes back. So, you, you, you know, that's probably a bad example in terms of it could be automated anyway. But we're manually inputting that. It could be things like creating fact find items as well. Like if it's in a chat experience, I have this account, this yeah, balance. So that, that's honestly, that is actually spot on where it would be used. It, okay. it, it allows back end systems and programs to get the, the technical term would be a schema, but it essentially it means that you will get your response back in this format each time. And so you'll be able to always rely on asking for X and it will be there. And so you can then pass it to your CRM as the email field or as a certain field, which we haven't been able to do. Anyone who's used AI, um, yeah. so I should say we haven't been able to do it with that such a high level of accuracy. But anyone who's used AI will know that if you go and ask for the same email 10 times, you'll get a different email every time. It'll be in a different, you know, it'll be a similar uh, style and similar structure, but it'll all be a little bit different. And that's AI variability. And that's what this will change over time. It'll allow that variability to come down to essentially zero. Yeah, I love it. That is so exciting. And then just sort of, um, you know, further on that AI side of things, but is does this relate to maybe custom GPTs at all or is that sort of a whole different um, beast? Uh, I'd say there may be a way to sort of circle that in in, in the future, but that's, a, that's I would say, a different beast, but a great one in itself. So custom GPTs, I think, are somewhere that a lot of businesses could be using AI more and are not. Yep. And so for, for a bit of context, custom GPTs is the ability to feed it information or data that you want it to work with. Um, and so simplest examples, you might pass it your entire marketing um folder for 2023 or four and say, can you please produce a post based on this? And it'll pick up your language. Some of the larger, more industry specific models for us is, um, sorry, use cases is you'll see someone like a CFS who's just signed a big deal with with um, Microsoft, but a product like First Tech, 
or someone like a net wealth who has all of their documents and their information, being able to say, go to that and query that, I think will be really, really big as, as we move forward. Uh, I think about it, you know, a CS team member who's trying to find X document or trying to find what a specific rule is on, let's say, when you can t- draw money out of a fund, et cetera. To be able to go and build what is called a custom GPT and ask that question, I think will be really big. Yeah. Or should be really big, but it's just lagging behind a little bit. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm totally with you. And it's just, it feels like instead of, you know, going to maybe their, I don't know, internet and there's a hundred PDFs in there, especially, yeah, you know, like investment investment managers, insurers where it's like, you know, which, which PDFs am I looking at? Like that feels like that's the ticket to getting the right answer the first time or dramatically reducing the sort of search time. Uh, in that case. I think uh, the reason I brought up the CFS example is something like a first tech mm. is their solution where you can go and query. And I think that it may be first tech and maybe a completely different uh, provider or solution. But I think uh, as time goes on, we'll start to see your exact use case. There'll be a company that collates all of the insurers, uh, different PDSs or product information sheets, et cetera. And you'll be able to go as a, as a third party and ask a question about 10 different insurers. Which, yeah, I think, I mean, any, anyone could see the use case to that, whether you're trying to compare products, find information, et cetera. Yeah, no, that is so, so cool and so exciting. Thank you, Cole, for sharing that. Um, you got me all excited again about AI. I think it's, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, a whole new world. Um, I guess going back to yourself, so in source automation and Scribe, is there anything you're maybe working on or excited about or the future of Scribe? Anything you want to share there? Yeah, so there's a, a few different angles we're looking at for Scribe. The the data one's the obvious one that I think a lot of people would answer if if they're sort of running or building a product like Scribe, the ability to query your your ex or past um, meetings. Something else that we're really driving for at the minute is a CRM integration. We're trying to build and set up CRM integrations for some of your bigger products. And what I mean by that is the ability to log into Scribe produce your file note, and then get you know a hundred list of your clients, search your client name, and it'll send it there directly as a note. It'll say you know the note category will be annual review meeting. And just to, to break that barrier in integrating your CRM, that's that's sort of the, the next big thing we're working on. Uh, it's, it's obviously got some challenges. There's mm. lots of things to do with data and security and connecting your applications. So it's definitely a slow and, and measured process, but it's something I'm, I'm very excited for. Awesome. No, good luck with that. I think, yeah, having a product that can stand on its own two feet and, you know, you're doing all the all the things that a lightweight tool does once you start yeah, introducing um, integrations and other APIs, like being able to manage that is a real um, challenge. And I think, yeah, it's a testament to the, like, it's incredible. Like, it's so simple. Like, it looks so simple on the front end, but I know you've done a lot of work in the back end to make it work and come out perfect the first time. So, congratulations. Is there, um, you know, what's the best way to, to learn more about Scribe or in-source automation if someone wants to learn more? Yeah, so you can head over to scribe.io and then it'll be ability to read, log in, we have frequently asked questions, etc. all the usual. Uh, insourceautomation.com.au is, is my website. Uh, um, and then additionally, you can head over to LinkedIn, shoot us a message. If you have any questions, tell us uh, Pat sent you and we'll, we'll help you out for sure. Nice. Cole, thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed the discussion today. Amazing, mate. Thank you very much for time. 